you've again done an excellent job being very careful in your presentation, uh, making sure not to exaggerate or uh, use hyperbole. But I did want to ask you, um, you have personally had a run in with what maybe we're not supposed to call uh, detention or camps or whatever. I, I'm not, I haven't gotten the memo that tells me what I am supposed to call it. Um, but uh, what happened? Yeah, well, I, look, I have, and 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 I mean, I use that term quite openly. I'm I'm pretty comfortable with it. Detention is when you cannot leave, so being detained is what it is. So I, you won't offend me, I can assure you. But um, the um, the, the look, the scenario here is we, we I obviously in my job, um, I travel a lot because uh, you know I'm a member of the the government, and uh, we travel to Canberra, which is effectively our Washington. I sit in the Senate over there. Um, so it's required a lot of travel. There have been periods where we haven't, but throughout the course of the last two years, um, we have seen a different way of doing it every time. On Very early on, when we would leave, we would come back from the Australian Capital Territory, which is where Canberra is. We would probably quarantine at home for two weeks and we got used to doing that. Then as things subsided a bit, we, we didn't at all. We would just return to normal life as I think has been the case in the United States, crossing boundaries. Um, as the days and weeks went on and the healthcare bureaucracies decided that, you know, they would become more prescriptive with their rules and requirements, these, these almost visa-like arrangements between travelling between states started to emerge. Uh, during our last trip, um, which was back in November, um, I left the state with one set of rules and came back to a different set of rules. Um, what that meant was that by the time I was coming back, I was required, as we're all parliamentarians, to apply for... The, the right to return to my home uh, through a specially crafted and I'm sure very clever system um, through the internet, uh, the entry check system, which had been developed here. Uh, I was denied twice the ability to come home and, uh, you know, you fill in the, you ask the questions and so on and so forth. And then ultimately um, I was told that I needed to go into a Medi hotel um, for 14 days uh, with no right of review. And I, I mean, you know, that has happened before, but it hasn't happened in any of the other previous, um, you know, uh, scenarios when we've been traveling. Uh, and of course, the thing that, that really stuck out in my mind, the thing that started to really um, raise concerns about the rationale for that was the fact that after 10 minutes of being told that, I got a call from a journalist who also knew about it. Uh, who knew about all the details in the same language that the, the email that I'd received telling me about it. Um, and then I was met by photographers and media at the airport in order to document the whole thing. And frankly, the exercise is not as bad as it looks. I, in fact, looked for the officials to tell them, I mean, look, I'm apparently told I need to go into a Medi hotel, but those officials are police officers. So the scene looked like you were being detained and dragged away, which you sort of were, but it wasn't quite as draconian as that. But once again, uh, the next day in our local newspaper, that was splashed across the front, you know, antic detained, you know, so on and so forth. And I spent um, 14 days there despite having had a COVID test, um, I think, uh, the day before leaving. And then we'll count them up, six during my time in the hotel <laughs> um, and no ability to get out. And I was taken to a Medi hotel once again, metal fence around the bottom, police there, um, you know, three meals brought to your door, um, you know, during the day with a knock on the door, like you're in, you're in a prison environment. Um, you can't leave to get the, uh, the meal more than three minutes before it's left. And you can't leave it out there longer than 10 minutes for you know, the reasons of science, presumably, who knows why. Um, and, you know, checks every day on your mental health. And I kept saying, well, I'm fine, but I'd be better if you'd let me go home. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, all this sort of stuff, you know, and so it was a nice hotel in the middle of the city, not far from where I've worked before. But if you can't leave that environment, you are in there. So what's the message that has been sent? I'd spent the last six months poking around the local health bureaucracy, who are the, you know, the, really the ones that made that decision, asking for documents, asking for information, asking them to show us the science that we're meant to trust, uh, and then fell on the receiving end of that little trick on the way through. And of course, um, the last 24 hours here in Australia have seen um, the world number one tennis player, Novak Djokovic, go through a similar experience. Um, he also is of Serbian extraction, so I'm not going to suggest for a minute there's some sort of Serbian anti-Serbian conspiracy in Australia. I, I would only say that in jest, but um, the, the, the similarities are frightening. He's currently in a Medi hotel in Melbourne, um, to the best of my knowledge, with no symptoms of COVID. 
Uh, and that really is the question here. Where's the science that says whatever it turns out to be the case, whether he's, there's an issue with vaccination or not or exemptions or not, well, where's the science that says allowing him in if he can test negative even, you know, yeah, but despite the fact that there are 100,000 cases of COVID floating around in our community across the country, where is the science that says that's a reasonable thing to do? And what is the reality for reputational damage for our country um, when this sort of stuff is happening? I mean, I, I, we just don't know the details yet. That matters in front of the courts at the moment. But um, this business of taking people and locking them up against their will, as you said earlier, quite rightly, it doesn't matter if it's in a five-star hotel and you're sitting around a pool. If I can't leave, if you can't leave, then you're being detained. It's as simple as that. And that is happening too commonly in this country at the moment. So it sounds to me uh, like both you and Mr. Djokovic were imprisoned to prevent you from transmitting a disease to others that neither of you apparently had. <laughs> I think that's about right. I um, think that's a very, very apt summary. Yeah. It does not. I mean, things may be different south of the equator, but north of the equator, that doesn't sound like it's logical to me. It just sounds um, beyond preposterous, in fact. Uh, Correct. I, it's hard to even know what to make of it. And I, you know, I think, you know, you said soft totalitarianism. Uh, I have used the term surgical totalitarianism. <laughs> there is something to the idea of we are being broken in on accepting certain things that uh, ourselves from two or three years ago would have uh, balked at in the strongest possible terms. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure even what to say about it, except at some level, just people need to listen to the description of what has happened. They need to hear you not leaping to conclusions about it, not saying anything beyond what actually happened, just the simple facts of it and ask themselves, are we being governed by rational people in our collective interest or is something else going on? Because increasingly, I don't think any of this actually squares the, with the idea that people who are obsessed with our medical well-being are perhaps a bit carried away. I, I don't think you can explain this that way. This looks like something is uh, taking a kind of power that we never would have given up absent an emergency, and it doesn't look like it's planning to give it back. No, and we, we say that all the time here. I mean, every day um, things seem to slip again. You know, we, we, we see this, that story about the Northern Territory yesterday um, is something that was unexpected because it felt as though we'd moved past all of that. And as you say, in a temporary environment where, uh, and I think the terminology used in this state is a, a major emergency has been declared and has been declared for two years you would assume that that major emergency would you know evaporate but of course we're not seeing that at all in fact if if anything i think we're seeing it getting ratcheted up in some some aspects so it, you know look it doesn't make sense what it is doing of course is and this is another entire limb but a societal limb is it's dividing australians and the anecdotal evidence from the christmas period is that it was a it probably was the same in the United States, a, a sort of a fraught period where families were fighting amongst themselves because of whether people wanted to even congregate in numbers at all. In, in this state, as we speak right now, our health bureaucrats have dictated that you cannot have more than 10 people in your home um, for any reason, as far as I'm aware. Um, you know, and, and, and businesses can't have more than 25% of their normal uh, customer flow. So throughout that new year period, um, businesses were just hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money. Their, their hard costs of rent and electricity, they don't change. Um, small businesses are, are facing this, this critical period. Families are facing this critical period. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And we are seeing that division rolling out through this country. And I, you know, like everybody who's involved in the public sphere and the public town hall, you know, sort of setting, I try to speak to people about it as rationally as I can. And I say, do you think you would understand this if I was to come back to you in, in two, three, five years and, you know, you had an app on your phone that told you you couldn't buy another tank of petrol gas, you know, uh, today because we're in the middle of a climate emergency? Because, you know, in one sense, it is hard to imagine a, a time where this won't continue if we don't stop it now, where social credit, as we see in places like China, um, isn't you know, at least more persuasive in here. And we were just told this week um, that in South Australia, there's a meat shortage. 
Um, you know, I'm sure there's a rational explanation for that, but you know, it also sounds a little bit like um, you know we have been hearing out of the World Economic Forum we have to cut down on meat and, and these sorts of things. You know, where does this stop? Do we end up becoming a, a country that is dominated by uh, the naughty or nice register that sits on our phone? And are people live enough to it? And, and will people, you know, when, for example, they go to the bottle shop uh, to buy, you know, a carton of beer and can't do it because, you know, they've already had one this week. Is that enough to wake people up? Um, because at the moment, I, I don't think that uh, those lines of, uh, of sort of thought have been joined, but I, I fear they're coming and I fear we need more people to speak up. Well, if I can say what I think I heard you just say in, in different terms, it seems to me that there are basically two possible systems. You can have a system in which your bureaucracy is empowered to decide when your rights apply and when your, your rights don't apply based on emergencies, of which there will be many, in which case, I don't know whether your climate example is sensible or not, but it's certainly no more preposterous than what we are seeing now. So, you know, is it acceptable for our governments of the West to decide, well, the time has come to uh, to eliminate your rights uh, over climate or, or racism or whatever else it's going to do? Um, or are we going to have a system in which the only thing, the only tool our bureaucrats have, should they wish to relieve us of our rights, is persuasion, where they actually have to convince us that this, in fact, does merit that step. And I think, you know, those of us who are paying attention have now seen enough of this to know that there is only one right answer to that question, a system in which they have to persuade us to put aside those rights temporarily because something necessitates it is the only tolerable system. One in which they are empowered to decide when we are in that situation is one that is automatically going to be abused uh, until, we, until, we, uh, until we change it. 